All right, guys, we're going to talk um, and go into section 6.3. We finished up with section 6.2, and um, in the past two sections, we talked about the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So in this section, we're going to kind of focus on the central nervous system and what exactly is the brain, what the brain does, um, so on and so forth. I do encourage you to take notes. Um, because I will be asking you, the, you to send them in to me so I can put them in as participation points. So please make sure that you keep up. It's easy with, with videos because if I'm going too fast, you can pause and rewatch and so on and so forth. All right, I do also encourage that you have your textbooks open with me so you can follow along with some diagrams. I'm not the best at drawing, so um, I left that to the textbook for the most part. So crank out your textbooks, flip to 6.3, which should be around page 207, um, and then let's get started. So we talked about the CNS, central nervous system, and we said that it's broken into two things. We said that it's broken into the brain and the spinal cord. But right now we're gonna focus in on the brain. There are a couple cool things about the brain that I just wanted you guys to know. First is that a typical brain is actually gonna weigh between two fourths to three fourths of a pound, um, which is, in relative to everything else in your body, it's not that much. Um, but it's cool because people actually have related the brain and how much it weighs and how big it is um, to how much intelligence you have. Um, so don't go comparing your brains to other people, but that's just for your own um, information. The brain is also broken down into four regions. Um, so it's broken down into the cerebrum, the dicephalon, the brainstem, which is also broken it down into three more things, um, and then the cerebellum. But right now we're gonna focus in on what the cerebrum is and kind of key functions that the cerebrum has when it comes to our body. So the first thing we need to know about the cerebrum is that it is the largest portion of the brain. Why is that the case? because it has a left and right cerebral um, hemispheres. But we call it cerebrum just to simplify um, it and include, so the cerebrum is going, going to include the left and right cerebral hemispheres. So rather than saying all of this every time you refer to it, we can just say, hey, it's in the cerebrum. Let's talk about the cerebrum. Okay, so let's get into some stuff about the cerebrum. The first thing you need to know about the cerebrum is that there are kind of two parts to it. There's an outside and there's an inside. So let's talk about the outside. The outside part of the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is um, mostly made out of gray matter because it has non-myelinated um, neurons. So we talked about that in the last chapter, how myelinated is white um, and non-myelinated looks kind of gray. So the cerebrum, on the outside, called the cerebral cortex, is gray matter because it's not myelinated. On the inside, though, um, of the cerebrum, you have the basal nuclei. The basal nuclei is um, going to be white matter, and that's because it is myelinated. All right? So these are the kind of the um, anatomy of the cerebrum, and then we'll talk about other parts of it, too. Um, so here's my little brain that I drew. He's really cute. Um, but I drew this brain because I wanted you guys to kind of understand a couple of things. If you notice, and if you've ever seen a brain, whether in actual, you know, physical form or um, an image, you notice that there's kind of these like bumps and ridges around, right? So they're not very smooth at all. Um, it's something we refer to as convoluted, all right? So the brain is convoluted. And what that really means is that there's two parts that give this convoluted um, look and texture. One is called the gyrus, which basically means that there's curves and raises in the brain that kind of looks like little bumps, right? So they kind of go up and down, up and down. They're not smooth, they're not um, uh, flat at all. And then there's something called the sulcus, which are the grooves that are created between the gyrus or the gyri, all right? So these two things, um, which cause like the texture, are kind of, um, are the reason we call it convoluted. So convoluted or convolutions are basically the gyrus and the sulcus. Um, what I want you to know is that no two brains are the same because of the convolution pattern, but we will talk about how the sulcus kind of remains in the same um, general area of the brain, and um, that is kind of what 
kind of stays uniform throughout everybody's brain, but it will not be the exact, um, the curves won't be the exact same, or the gyrus definitely um, will be a little bit different from one brain to another. All right, guys, if you open up to page 208 in your textbook, you're going to see a diagram, which is actually really, really well done, of an exterior view of the brain and then kind of the brain broken up into the different different regions that we talked about. Um, and then also you can see the sulcus, you can see um, just the gyrus um, on the brain. And so we'll refer back to these pictures. So just have it open up as I go over the rest of the notes. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the sulci. Um, the sulci is basically going to play an important role in the brain where it's gonna divide the brain into four regions. And those four regions are each called a lobe, all right? So you have the frontal lobe, you have the parietal lobe, you have the temporal lobe, and then you have the occipital lobe, all right? So if you kind of jump over to this picture on the page 206, uh, sorry, 208, you can see the frontal lobe up here in the front, the temporal lobe right here, the parietal lobe, and then the occipital lobe all the way in the back. Um, so those are good for just having a picture in your mind of what exactly they look like. Now, the thing about the sulci that I mentioned um, a couple seconds ago is that they remain positioned. So they're going to be in the area that they're located um, in every single brain. So they're not gonna, you're not gonna have one sulci in one area in me, in my brain, and then in the sulci in another area in your brain. So they're gonna um, all be in the same position in all of the brains. Now, in a um, with the sulcus or the sulci, you also have something called the fissures. So I'm going to move over here to the diagram real quick and just show you. So you can see the sulcus, right? So you have the central sulcus that kind of splits the frontal from the parietal. You have the lateral sulcus that's separating the temporal lobe um, from the parietal um, and the frontal. So you can see how they're kind of playing their role in separating all of the lobes so that they're not kind of, uh, they're being differentiated. So you will all have the central uh, sulcus in the same area. You'll all have the lateral sulcus in the same area um, and the parieto occipital sulcus in the same area. So that's going to stay the same. So there's also something called fissures. And just like the sulcus that we say that the sulcus remains in the same position to all brains, the fissures are also going to be positioned in the same um, location. And what the fissures are, are just really deep groves in the brain. And the most important fissure that we're going to talk about is, if I move over here, is a longitudinal fissure. So this fissure is actually going to run all the way down your brain. And the main role of this is that it's going to separate um, your left and right um, hemispheres of your brain. So let's look at that. So the longitudinal fissure that I just talked about and showed you over here that you can look in your book, all right, it is going to run the length of the brain and it's going to divide the brain into right and left hemispheres. This is really important because this tells you which side of the brain controls which side of your body. So let's look at that. This is where it's kind of funky. So the right hemisphere is actually going to control the left side of your brain. Interesting. And then the left hemisphere of your brain is actually going to control the right side of your body. So it's kind of backwards or flipped when you look at it. How, why that happens, I'm not really sure. We can ask God when we get to heaven, but that's just how it is. All right. So. Now that we talked about fissures and sulcus, and then we also talked about gyrus, we're gonna go and move on into the lobes. All right guys, let's talk about the frontal lobes. So the frontal lobe is going to actually be located right behind your forehead, all right? It's gonna be the most interior part of the brain, and it's going to be separated from the rest of the lobes of the brain by something called the central sulcus, all right? So those are the first two facts that I have written down right here. And I kind of drew a little funny looking brain. I did the best that I could because I wanted you guys to visually see um, an important part of the frontal lobe. And one of the most important parts of the frontal lobe is something called the primary motor cortex. 
Now this primary motor cortex is going to be located right anterior to the central sulcus. So we talked about how the central sulcus is right here. So the primary motor cortex is going to be located like right in front of that line. All right. So what exactly does the primary motor cortex do? Let's find out. So the primary motor cortex is actually going to play an important important role in controlling the skeletal muscles of your body. And it does this is because it's going to send neural impulses from your brain to your skeletal muscles so that they can move, that they can have, you know, your muscles can have um, relaxed, uh, they can relax, they can tense up, you can go for a run, you can do, um, just move your body in any way that it needs to move. And that is because of your primary motor co uh, cortex. So a lot of people who have injury to this area of the brain lose the function to move voluntarily, um, which is kind of sad, whether it's from a stroke or whether it's in a car accident or some other brain injury. Um, this is a really huge part of your brain that helps you with moving. So that's why with um, any kind of brain injury, they make sure that you're good to go, especially in your primary cortex area. Um, now I want to jump to figure six, um, Point ten uh, on page 209 and that kind of shows this funky picture right here um, it also kind of looks like the brain that I just drew um, but it has another component that I didn't want to confuse you guys with that's why I drew my little brain over here so if we look at this figure um, figure 610 on page 209 I want you guys to look on the left side where it says primary motor cortex all right which is right in front of the central sulcus like we just talked about um, this pink area right here so pink pink um, and you might notice that um, there are weird par body parts around this area and there is a purpose for this. So you might have seen this image in a couple other areas. I know I've seen this long before I understood what it was. Um, and basically what this picture is portraying is that um, bigger areas of your um, primary motor cortex actually control smaller areas of your body. So if you look at this big chunk right here, it's actually controlling your eye movement, like blinking, squinting, your face, so maybe smiling, frowning, your lips, maybe when you're eating, you're licking your lips because they're dry, or movement of your jaw when you're eating. Those are smaller movements compared to, say, moving your trunk, or your hip, or your knee, or your elbow. Um, and that's interesting, is because the way that this is arranged this way is because the smaller movements of your body actually require a lot more um, focus and accuracy than the bigger movements of your body. So if I'm moving my trunk from right to left, that's going to require less accuracy than if I'm blinking or if I'm licking my lips or if I'm moving my fingers and so on and so forth. So that's why um, this is an important picture and it's really cool to see how the bigger areas of your um cortex are associated with smaller movements of your body. All right, so let's move on to another important part about your frontal lobe. All right, so to continue with the frontal lobe, this just means continue, um, I want to talk to you guys about something called the Broca's area. So this area is actually really important in that it helps with controlling your tongue and your lip movement to talk, to uh, form speech, right? A lot of people who don't have um, proper speaking abilities or they're not able to, uh, they may be able to think about what they want to say, but they can't actually produce it because their lips and their tongue don't have the right coordination to move. Um, this is because there's damage to the Broca's area. And this can happen with stroke patients. Like I said before, um, it can happen um, with for the primary motor cortex area. Um, it can happen when you have a car accident or some other kind of brain damage. Um, this, can, this area can actually be really effective. And like I said, this is when you are trying to talk and you don't have the ability to talk, but you may be able to, you will be able to think about what you want to say. So say I said, I am thinking, hey, I need some water, but my tongue and my um, lips are not able to form the words to say, hey, I need some water. Um, so this is really, can be really frustrating for patients who have damage to this area um, because they cannot communicate what they need or what they're feeling or what they're thinking, even though they can clearly think about it. All right, so moving on, there's another area in your frontal lobe and it's called the association uh, cortex. 
And this is going to be the most anterior part of your frontal lobe. And this area has to do with um, just your intellect. So this is pretty much um, how much knowledge you have, um, how much you can process and think about um, certain things. So when we talk about Broca's area, and I said this is when you can actually think but not actually say um, what you're thinking, this is usually um, if there's damage to this area, you can't really think. Um, and if you have no damage to this area, you can you start kind of blabbering. So if you have a, a damage to your association cortex but no damage to your Broca's area, that means that you're not able to think clearly but you can still talk very well. But if you have a... Um, damage to your Broca's area but no damage to your association cortex, that usually means that um, you can't talk but you can think. So if you just want to, if that kind of confuses you, just re-listen to what I just said, um, it's, you'll eventually understand it. So um, cool things to know, um, especially when you're studying stroke patients or patients who have been in pretty intense car accidents and kind of assessing um, what they're able to do, whether they're able to talk clearly and you can understand them. That means, you know, they're okay. But if they're able to talk, but um, it's very, you know, slurred speech, no, not making any sense, they probably have damage to their association cortex in their frontal lobe. Um, or if they look like they know what they want to say, but they can't communicate it and they're getting frustrated, um, that means they have uh, damage to their Broca's area usually. All right, so let's move on to another lobe in your um, uh, frontal lobe. And this is, uh, I'm sorry, another lobe in your brain, and this is called a parietal lobe. Um, so the parietal lobe is located right behind your frontal lobe right here. It's a purple one. And um, there's also a sulcus that's going to separate your parietal lobe from your <clears throat> occipital lobe, and that's called the parieto occipital sulcus. Um, and we're going to see some information about that. So the parietal lobe, like I said, is posterior to your frontal lobe, and it's going to have a pretty important part to it as well. So like the frontal lobe had the primary motor cortex, the parietal lobe has an important part called the primary somatic sensory cortex. And what this does is that it's going to interpret the sensory input that it's receiving from different parts of your body. So it's going to inter uh, interpret um, information from your skin, from your internal organs, your digestive organs, um, your liver, or your muscles, or your joints. And it's going to be able to give your brain an interpretation of what exactly they are feeling or what um, they're trying to communicate. So if we look um, back at figure 610 on page 209, um, we're going to see this green um, image right here. So we talked about the red one or the pink one, the primary motor cortex, and we kind of saw it in reference to the brain, the pink right here in the frontal lobe, right here. Um, and then now in the parietal lobe, you have something called the sensory, the somatic sensory cortex, and that's this green um, image right here. And basically, what I wrote down some key points is that this green image for the primary sensory cortex is actually going to show you how much sensory input is being received from different parts of your body. So you can see that this part is going to be receiving a lot of information from your eyes, your nose, your face, your lips. And it's a lot bigger because those areas are a lot more sensitive. So if you see that your hand is a lot more highlighted here than... Um, your trunk or your hip, it's because this is this area, your forearm, your hand, your fingers, your thumb are a lot more sensitive than your trunk and other um, and your hip and your leg because they're very small. So the amount of sensory information that they get gets very highly perceived in your brain and um, are up for more interpretation than your trunk or your hip. All right, so that's pretty much what this picture is showing you right here. All right, so let's talk about the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is located um, posterior to the parietal lobes. So if we look, let's move this right over here, you can see the occipital lobe is right below the parietal lobe, adjacent to the temporal lobe. And um, so we're gonna talk about what exactly the occipital lobe does. So the occipital lobe, right here, my friend Jerry, let's name him Jerry, um, it's going to help with Jerry's vision, all right? So that's the main job of the occipital lobe. A lot of people know the occipitals, you know, have to do with vision. So that's an easy way to remember. Um, so that's basically their main function is to help with vision. 
So now let's move on to the temporal lobe. So the temporal lobe um, is going to have uh, a sulci divide two sides of the temporal lobe, right? So you're going to see one side here, the other side on the other side of the brain. Um, and the temporal lobe is going to be divided in half by the lateral sulcus. So it's going to divide pretty much um, one side from the other. And it's also going to be the most inferior lobe. So if we talked about superior and inferior, superior, superior means it's on top, inferior means that it is on the bottom. So you can think of someone who's superior to you, that means they're probably the head honcho of you, and then someone inferior, someone that um, kind of is below you. So um, it's going to, the temporal lobe is going to be located um, right below the parietal and the frontal lobe, like we just saw in the image a couple seconds ago. So what exactly is the function of the temporal lobe? So it has a couple important functions. So it's important with speech, um, and the thing about speech, which we talked about um, a couple uh, seconds ago, is that um, it's ex kind of in the located um, right between the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe, and the parietal lobe. Um, so it's kind of nudged in, um, kind of nudged in between all four of those, and it kind of uh, causes a intersection. So that's my intersection sign right there. And then you also have the temporal lobe helping with hearing, um, and it helps if you think about your ears are closest to your temporal lobe. Um, it helps with vision, it helps with memory, and it helps with emotion. So all of these are very, very important, and they all have to do with um, uh, the temporal lobe. All right? So this is kind of concluding um, half of 6.3. I don't want to put all of them on here um, just because it's a lot of information to take in. So I will be assigning some assignments for you to do, and so please make sure you do them and email them to me. I am sorry that this is going up a lot later. I had three other YouTube videos that I had to uh, make content for, film, edit, post with all the other assignments. Um, so it was a lot of work for me, but I know that you guys will have a lot of grace on me. So just, um, this is going to be due in a couple days, so just be on top of that, and then I will um, upload the next set of assignments um, a couple days later. Alright, if you have any questions, please email me. I look forward to them.